Well, welcome everyone. Today is Friday, but we gathered as a church. Today is considered Good Friday, um, Holy Weekend. So I thank you for joining in worship together. We hope and pray that this can play a part in um, just encouraging you to, to be thoughtful of, of God's great love shown to us through the death and sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. So let's um, have a moment of silence as we prepare our hearts before we do the call to worship. Please join me in today's call to worship. Uh, the prayers and the call to worship will reflect uh, today being Good Friday. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. For us and for our salvation. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us worship God. Let us pray together. We come to the foot of your cross, Lord Jesus, and we weep with the disciples. With Mary, we ponder the mystery of your life and death. With those who witness your love in word and action, we proclaim the truth of who you are. We come to you this day because you first came to us. We come to love you because you first loved us. We come to serve you because you first served us. We come to worship humbled by your love for us, offering our love to you. Hear us now as we together offer this prayer of confession. God of mercy, love and mercy, you sent Jesus into the world so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Yet our lives are often less than you hope for. We have filled the world with violence and terror because we do not trust the way of compassion and service. In the face of uncertainty and trouble, we give up on you and one another. We do not trust the power of your love. Lord, have mercy on us for the sake of Christ, our Savior and Lord. More than any other day, brothers and sisters, let us hear the good news. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship? Distress, peril, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through the God who loves us. Neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No matter what is happening around us, no matter what we have done, God's deep love will never, ever let us go. Amen. With that good news in our hearts, we invite the praise team forward as they lead us in song today. Good morning. Welcome to Celebration Center. Um, Um, it's our second annual um, Good Friday service here, and it's um, it's great to see everyone out. When I think of Good Friday, I think of um, one year we showed the uh, movie Passion of the Christ, and and then just felt how much suffering Jesus went through on the cross. Um, 
and when we put ourselves in that place, it it really brings it home how much He loves us. Um, so this song, um, the wonderful cross, you wouldn't think cross is a a wonderful thing, but it's a symbol of um, God's love and um, for us. Um, there's so many symbol symbols of the uh, cross, but uh, I think of a of Him suffering. Um, but also for his love for us. So I invite you all to stand if you're able. <clears throat> song song
Good morning. Please join me as we pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, as we gather today, help us, Lord, um, to remember, Lord, your unfailing love, Lord, and your sacrificial love for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that you died on the cross for us, Lord, so that we may have eternal life. Lord, help us to live each and every one of our days reflecting that truth. And Lord, we pray for... um, for Amy's mom, Lord, as uh, she is in Asia, and thank you, Lord, that she is recovering from the stroke, and she's see- the word that they are seeing signs of improvement, Lord. We pray that you would continue to be with her, be with the doctors, Lord, who are um, assisting her, Lord. We pray that you be with Amy and her sister and her family and their cousins as well. For everyone that's um, looking after Amy's mom, Lord, I pray that you would give them strength and energy to take care of her, Lord. And Lord, we thank you so much, Lord. Ultimately, Lord, everything is in your control and your hands, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, we pray for all the ministries in our church. We pray for Flow Ministries. Lord, we pray for Young Do um, Kang's ministry. We pray for Mark Lee Chan and his work with AFC. We pray for Sam and Linda, Lord, and and their work with the newcomers. We pray for Robin Maria, Lord, and and um all the ministries that are happening, Lord, we pray that you would help them to be effective, Lord. Help use each and every one of the people involved in the ministries, Lord, to um, to be your vessels, Lord. Help others to come to know you through uh, the work that they are doing. Ultimately, Lord, we know, Lord, that they are just planting the seeds and that you are in control of the outcome, Lord. Help them to continue to rely on you 
and give them physical strength, um, emotional strength, Lord, and spiritual strength to serve in the ways that you want them to serve, Lord. Lord, we pray for um, those in our congregation who are looking after uh, elderly parents or other people in their family as well. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and give them patience, Lord, and give them um, continued energy and strength to um, do all that they need to do as well, Lord. Lord, we lift up all these things into your most precious and holy name. Amen. Please join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, in worship on Good Friday. Um, as always, our hope and prayer is that we can encourage you to be mindful of this uh, holy weekend as we look forward to Easter Sunday. Um, just one announcement. Uh, we do invite all of you to join us for regular Sunday worship in two days, but there we'll be celebrating uh, Easter. So. Uh, we will have communion as well, so we hope all of you can join in worship at that regular time at 9.30 over at the uh, usual um, location at UPC. Um, before I, I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 27, the reading for today, verses 11 to verse 50. Today we're going to look at the whole gamut of the story of Jesus' uh, last hours, beginning with his trial before Pilate and then going toward his ultimate death on the cross. Um, it is a big reading, so I'm not going to read it all, but just highlight a few of the verses that I will mention in our, our teaching session today. I'm just going to give you a heads up that today will be a little bit different from uh, whatever you might think a Good Friday service or sermon is. We are using the text of Jesus' last hours, but my hope is that I can... I challenge you in a different angle, so to speak. Um, if you remember what we talked about on past Sunday, Passion Sunday, then this will be a kind of a continuation of that, or at least there's a connection to that. So um, maybe take a moment to think about what did Pastor Billy talk about last Sunday, and it will make sense uh, going forward today. Um, I'm going to read Matthew 27, verses 11 to 14, and then 33, 34, and then uh, 45 to 46. The word of God for the people of God as we gather in holy worship on this day we call Good Friday. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Do you not hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Down to verse 33. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, Jesus refused to drink it. And then verse 45, 46. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be 
to God. Let us pray as we prepare to hear today's teaching. Lord, we are grateful for an opportunity on this sacred and holy day to gather in worship. Before we look forward to Easter Sunday and a celebration of the resurrection and new life you've given to us, Lord, we pause to acknowledge that we need to go through Good Friday before we get to Resurrection Sunday. So Lord, as we gather in worship today, we ask that you may give us an understanding of why we are here as we sing our songs and offer our prayers of confession. And now as we hear the today's teaching that we may sense your presence, we may have a better understanding of what it is that happened to our Lord Jesus and what it ought to mean for us as we try to live the life you want us to live. Open our hearts and minds, we pray, O oh God. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Before we get into the, the text of Matthew 27, I want to bring to mind another passage in the New Testament uh, from the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Philippi, and in that letter, he wrote these words, I want to know Christ and the power of resurrection, his resurrection. Now, this is a favorite verse for many Christians, and maybe some of you, this is your one of those key verses that you write down or you have it somewhere in your house or in your study, uh, something that you look toward uh, regularly. It is a favorite verse for many people, many Christians. It describes a person who doesn't just want to know about Jesus, but rather a person who wants to really know Jesus and everything he has to offer. I want to know Jesus and the resurrection, all the benefits that come from that. But here's the thing. Paul did not stop there. That's just the beginning of the reading. He goes on to say, the rest of chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 goes like this. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then he goes on. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. You notice the words, suffering, death. What is Paul talking about? You see, Paul understood that there is no Easter without Good Friday. Makes sense, right? There is no resurrection if there is no death. So before we get into Easter, we need to pause and consider what led up to Easter. There is no Easter without Good Friday. There is no resurrection without death. Today, as we gather on this sacred day called Good Friday, we remember the terrible suffering and death of Jesus. We know the story. It was totally unfair. Jesus did not deserve what was done to him. He committed no crime. He did nothing wrong, and yet he was brutally beaten by Roman soldiers, he was mocked and spat upon by an angry crowd. He was sentenced to death by evil men. None of us can relate to what Jesus went through. Even our worst experiences do not compare. But today's invitation is this. As we once again look at Jesus' final hours, I want to ask you to consider, are there lessons that we can learn from his example? And I believe we can. We can learn from his example. We can learn how to respond when we find ourselves in similar situations, where we are treated unjustly. Because here's a fact of life. And that is, in your lifetime, my lifetime, each and every one of us, you will be treated unfairly. Sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small ways, but it will happen such as life. There will, be peop there will be times when people in power over you will misuse their power and you become the victim. There will be times when people say things to you that are very mean-spirited and cruel. 
There'll be times when people say things about you that are not true. There will be times when you have to suffer for other people's mistakes. Not your own, but someone else. But you have to face the music. It isn't right, but it's life, and it happens. It happens to all of us. In Matthew chapter 27, we get a glimpse of how Jesus responded when he was treated unfairly. So my invitation today is we can learn from his example. Let me tell you right now that his example goes against the grain of every natural tendency that you and I have. It's not easy to suffer as Jesus suffered. But again, here's the invitation from Philippians. We must remember that in becoming like him in his suffering, becoming like Jesus in his death, Paul says that's how you and I experience the resurrection power in our lives. What does that mean? By looking at Jesus' example, I hope that we can make a headway into that, but more than that, to give you something to think about. What can we learn from Jesus' example? How did Jesus respond when he was treated so unfairly? Three things I want to share with you today. Number one, we can learn something from Jesus' silence, from his silence. Verses 11 to 14. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Yes, it is as you say. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Verse 13, then Pilate asked him, do you not hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Notice that Jesus was not completely silent. He was asked, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responded with a simple, straightforward answer. Yes, it is as you say. When did Jesus stop talking? when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders. Why did he stop talking? Because at that point, it was no longer an interview. It was no longer an interview looking for what's happening, what, what is the truth of what's happening here. It was no longer an interview. It became an interrogation filled with accusations, false allegations, and so on and so on. In the other, other Gospels, Mark and Luke, we learn a little bit more. Jesus was accused of telling people not to pay your taxes. Jesus was accused of causing riots wherever he went, and so on and so on. These accusations were untrue. But it would have been pointless for Jesus to argue, because the religious leaders were not interested in the truth, and neither was Pilate. So Jesus decided to keep silent. Do you see the lesson there? The lesson for us, there are times when you are right, you are absolutely right, but it may be wise and better to keep silent. For example, in the face of gossip, it hurts when people talk about you, especially when what they say isn't true. However, most of the time, it does no good to respond to worship, because those who spread gossip and those to listen to gossip. They're not interested in the truth. Critics also are not interested in the truth. Their minds are already made up. They think they're right, and so their goal is to prove you wrong. In my experience, when you get into an argument with a critic, it's not worth it. You become just like them. I think this is good advice. Never argue with a critic. When Jesus was asked a straightforward question, he gave a straightforward answer. But when he was faced with lies and false allegations, he did something that we often have a very hard time doing. What is that? He took a stance of silence. He took a stance of deliberate silence. There are times when you and I, we need to do that as well. Number two, another S word. We can learn something from Jesus' attitude, attitude toward suffering. Suffering. 
First one was silence. Second one, suffering. Verse 33. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Question, what, what was this, this wine mixed with gall? Um, there are basically two theories. One is uh, it was a drug to numb the body so that you know, the, it would deaden the pain. Number two, it was a poison meant to speed up the dying process. Whichever one it is, the point is that Jesus refused to drink it. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew what he had to endure, but he refused to do anything to minimize his suffering. Do you remember what happened earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane? Before our reading in Matthew 27, three times Jesus prayed at the Garden if he could avoid going to the cross. Three times he also prayed, but not my will, but yours be done. And he got his answer. There was no way to avoid death. In order to be obedient to the the calling that he that was given to him, he had to go the distance. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made his decision. He committed himself to do what God wanted him to do, no matter what the cost. So when the soldiers prepared to nail his hands and his feet to the cross, Jesus had a chance to take a shortcut. He had a chance to take a drug and escape the pain. But he refused. Why? Because the plan was for Jesus to suffer for the sins of the world. And there was no shortcut. There was no shortcut around that. He made the decision to follow God's will every painful step of the way. Let's unpack this further because I think there's a key connection to you and me. The Bible, when we read it, it often tells us or teaches us how God wants to take away our suffering, yes? God wants to take away our suffering, to heal the pain in our lives, to give us comfort, to give us peace and joy, so on and so on. That is absolutely true. The Bible teaches that. When there is sin in our lives that has brought pain and sorrow into our lives, you and I, we can experience God's forgiveness. God's mercy, God's comfort, and so on and so on. Even when we are the cause of the sin. When there is pain from a, from a broken heart or broken dreams or a broken life, you and I, we can experience the healing presence of God himself. God can work a miracle. You and I can be restored. This is absolutely true. This is good news that scripture tells us again and again and again. But having said that, what is also true is that sometimes when following Christ, you and I, we have to walk a road of suffering. See the connection to last week. You and I have to walk a road of suffering. We never suffer without a purpose. We never suffer alone. But there are times when following Jesus involves suffering. And if you're like me, when that happens, you and I, we're tempted to look for a shortcut, right? We begin to ask, do I need to go through this? Is there any way I can get out of this? And it's completely natural. In those times, you must take the attitude of Christ. And we say, if this is a road that I must travel, then I would travel it faithfully every step of the way. There is a Vietnamese evangelist pastor named To Dinh Trung. He was arrested for preaching the gospel to the Kaho tribe in North Vietnam years ago when Vietnam was separated. He was beaten by the police, dra dragged away to prison, where he waited six months for his trial to even begin. And while he was in prison, Trung saw this as 
a divine opportunity. How's that? He saw this as a divine opportunity to preach to those around him, preach to the lost, to go on doing what he felt God wanted him to do. After all, what else could the communist do to him? He's already in jail, right? And through his efforts, many fellow prisoners came to Christ. Now, during this time, Christians around the world heard about his plight. They began to pray and they began to petition and write letters to the Vietnamese government on, on, on his behalf and so on and so on. So much pressure was put onto the Vietnamese authorities that they eventually relented. They offered Trung an early release. He didn't take it. He refused. Why? Because he recognized that this was an opportunity to minister to those who were in prison with him. And so he decided to stay. He said, I do not care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my calling, my task given to me, my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave to me, to share and to tell the people the good news about God's grace. Now, truth of the matter is, few, very few, if not any of us, would be ever be called to upon to suffer to such an extent, right, for the cause of Jesus. But there will be times when we have to suffer. At work, in our relationships, maybe at home, in our families, maybe even in our area of ministry where you are serving. We need to decide now that we will face head on whatever suffering may come our way. No shortcuts. No shortcuts. In doing so, we become like Jesus in his death. And we experience power of his resurrection. Do you want to become like Jesus? Yes, of course, we say this all the time. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want the benefits of being a follower of Jesus Christ. I want all of God's blessings in my life. I want Easter Sunday. Do you want to become like Jesus? Before Easter, there is Good Friday. Follow his example of suffering, decisive suffering. Number three, in following Jesus' example, we can learn something about the third S, his sacrifice. Silence, suffering, sacrifice. Look at verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, this is just... Um, uh, basically, it means sixth hour is about noon, and the ninth hour is about 3 p.m. Okay, so uh, back in the day, I think the way they didn't have cell phones and telling them what time of the day it is, but so uh, the morning, what the day would start around dawn, six-ish, right? So uh, taking that into consideration, sixth hour would be about noon, and the ninth hour would be about 3 p.m. Darkness came over all the land. Something that will happen in April 8th, right? Remember, it's going to happen. Don't look up at the sun. Don't. But the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus said these words, he wasn't being dramatic. Drama queen, woo! He wasn't being poetic. He was referring to a literal event that was taking place before the eyes of everyone who was watching what was happening. At that moment, God turned his back on his very own son. Isaiah, many, many years ago, foretelling this, said it this way, this way, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. The Lord God laid on him the iniquity, fancy word meaning sins. The Lord God laid on him the iniquity of us all, meaning your sins, your screw-ups, your mistakes our broken promises to one another, to God himself, all of that was heaped on 
Jesus, and he paid them all. He paid for them. He sacrificed his life for us. He sacrificed his life so that you and I, we could have life. I imagine that every one of us knows what it's like to feel abandoned by God. Even if you've been a Christian for many years, there are seasons of up and down, and I'm sure all of us, whatever situation we may be going through, we feel that we are abandoned by God. I don't think any of us has not felt this way. And if you haven't, you will. Every one of us knows what it's like to feel abandoned by God, but here's where I need all of us to pay attention. But... Any such feeling is untrue. It's based on self-pity. Follow me. Don't, don't, Don't discount me yet. Every one of us knows what it's like to feel abandoned by God, but any such feeling is a trick. It's based on self-pity. It's not true. It's not true. Why? Because Jesus experienced, he himself, that verse, he himself experienced true abandonment in our place. In our place. He cried out the words, my God, why have you forsaken me so that you and I will never have to say those words? He made his life a sacrifice so that we could fully experience the fullness of God's presence in our lives every single moment with no fear of abandonment. In other words, he gave his life so that you might have life. Earlier I read a verse from Philippians. Paul said it once again, chapter 3, Philippians 10, 11. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. How do we do that? By living a life of sacrifice. By giving ourselves to others. By living to serve others. Many years ago, there was this bestseller book called The Purpose Driven Life. Who's read this book? It's probably more common that there's no one who's not read this book. Do you remember page one? Page one, the very first words, the very first sentence of that book. Do you remember what it said? It said, it's not about you. It's not about you. Another very well-known pastor in the States called Max Lucado, he wrote a book called It's Not About Me. And it follows the same idea. Max Lucado's book, It's Not About Me, has a a subtitle. And the subtitle of that book is, It's Not About Me, subtitle, Rescue from the Life We Thought Would Make Us Happy. You see, for years, the focus of so many books, even Christian help books, whatever you want to call it, for years, the focus of so many books has been, how can I have it all? How can I have the life of my dreams? Do you remember last week? How can I experience all God's blessings? How can I experience Easter, the power of the resurrection, and on and on and on? And I think now we are finally beginning to understand and learn that self-centered living does not deliver what it promises. We're beginning to learn that true joy, true fulfillment, true connection with the living Christ comes through sacrificial living. And Jesus modeled that life of sacrifice for us. He lived and died giving to others. And I suggest to you that that's an example you and I, we need to follow. Yes, God wants us to experience the power of the resurrection of Christ in our lives. What a wonderful verse. Philippians 3, verse 10, 11. Underline it, print it, attach it somewhere where you can see it. But there can be no resurrection until there is a death. 
that ought to speak to us. We must be willing to die. We must be willing to share in Jesus' suffering. And that means that there will be times when you and I will be on the receiving end of injustice. And instead of getting sidetracked and arguing and confronting and endless debates with the opposition, there are times and it's wise for you and I to stand silent. There will be times when the road we travel is paved with suffering. And instead of looking for a shortcut, we will have to make that tough decision to stay put, to meet it head on, to endure it every step of the way. And there will be times when you and I will be called upon to sacrifice our time, our money, maybe even our lives. And even if we are called to give it all up, I say to you, it cannot compare with the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me. Brothers and sisters, let us follow Jesus' example. Let us remember that it is through sacrificial living that we then can experience the power of his resurrection in our, in our very own lives. The main point, without death, there is no resurrection. Without Good Friday, there is no Easter. Today, after the closing song, there will be no benediction to end the service. Similar to what we did last year, and many churches end their Good Friday service that way. I'm going to invite you to remain in your seats after the song is done for a quiet time of prayer and reflection until you are ready to leave. When I ask of you, think about his silence. Think about his suffering. Think about his sacrifice for you. There is no Easter without Good Friday. Let's pray. God, today is Friday. It's not a Sunday. But here we are gathered in worship. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one of us who's gathered in person and those who are joining online, that we recognize and at least in some way we acknowledge the importance of today being Good Friday. And we set a time to stay or this time with you. Today we are reminded again of Jesus' great sacrifice suffering, his death for us. We acknowledge and give you thanks, Lord, that he was willing to go to the cross for us. But we also acknowledge, O oh Lord, today that he calls us even further to follow him. And in the moments of our suffering, in the moments when we are called upon and we don't know why we go through what we go through, the moments when we decide, no, we don't want this. We want a shortcut. We want Easter. We want the blessings of God and the resurrection power. My prayers for my brothers and sisters who find themselves stuck here on Good Friday, suffering, called to sacrifice again and again. God, would you instill in them the hope of Easter Sunday by giving us the strength and courage because we know we need to get through Good Friday before we get to Easter Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Give us your grace. Give us your mercy, because we so need it. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the praise team forward as they lead us in our response song.
this song, um, I think it's a, a relatable song um, for Good Friday. It's how deep the Father's love for us, that um, his, his suffering, his sacrifice uh, for our sins, the weight of the world's sin. Uh, so I invite you all to stand if you're able.